doesn't, I'm just jumping in. So you can either talk yourself or I'm going to pull it out of you. I'll let you be. I'll pull it out of you. Okay. No, you tell us okay. as you know. Okay, I'll tell you what I know. Uh, I never met her and not Neil. And she's the only person in the earth uh, that I feel that way about. Um, she's just uh, a woman that loves God and loves people, and she doesn't like it. We just laugh. She thought it was weird the first hundred times, and now she's just used to it. But the um, she is brave and fearless. Um, she would go into the bush uh, when they took little girls into the bush by the LRA, and she would go grab them and bring them back and scold the soldiers. Um, so she drinks beer. I like that about her. I the first Nile beer I've ever had. The first beer since high school. Like I had with her on the rooftop. I'm like, well, whatever. She's drinking. I like and now I like it. So she's a woman that uh, has uh, these big ideas. These big ideas about grace and love and and then what can be accomplished. She's entrepreneurial to the core. She'll start a filling station just so she can load up 18 wheelers, make a bunch of cash, and give it away. Um, she is a, a fighter, like she's a scrapper. And then, while it's not her favorite thing to do to get on airplanes, she's constantly flying back and forth to the U.S. Um, to meet with people and let them know. She is no stranger to the prisons. Uh, she figured out how to take a bottle cap and turn it into a purse. Do you have to pick, get one of those over there, Mike? You can hold that up. This is a purse made out of like a thousand pull tabs. That's sister. She takes these water bottles, fills them with dirt, and makes homes out of them. Uh, she's, She's just this uh, really selfless person that's, uh, when I asked her, like, how do you do all this? And she said, just prayer and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a little bit of an introduction, my friend. I've got more, but tell us more about, tell us about why you're doing what you do and how did you end up here? And I, he has said a lot, and some of them I don't want to say you here, not. No, exactly. <laughs> a lot of them are not true. Like, for instance, he says I'm fearless. It's not true. I'm having a lot of fear. And uh, now there's just a book which has been written on me. If you read it, you find exactly what is right and what is not yeah, right. Yeah, hold that one up. And, uh, Isn't that great? There's a book in, like, in Barnes and Noble and, wow. and all this. And, isn't that crazy? Oh, and she's seeing the woman of the year. Oh, I forgot that one. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, in that book, they really just tried to capture my life. And uh, it took me so long to accept the book to be written. I didn't like it. Reggie Witten, who, was, who started organization First for Africa to support the work we're doing here with all the sisters, the children, and women wanted very much to put my life into writing, and I didn't like it at all. <laughs> you know how hard it is, for instance, to watch yourself on a big screen or to hear yourself speak. Mm -hmm. You would never believe it is you speaking, or you would never believe that it's you on a big screen. And that's what I was trying to avoid. But Reggie never left me, he insisted. And at the end, I actually thought that it is not about me. My life is just there to represent the lives of other people whose life may not, may not be narrated or whose suffering will not be told by anybody. And so I can speak on their behalf. And I accept it. And Reggie always said that I was very uncooperative. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. But now, since the book came out, that is one of the reasons for which I'm going back and forth. Because it just came out in November, together with the documentary film, which also came out and it's going to different film festivals. We had one at Napa Valley in November. It's where it premiered. And it's going to come again in uh, Florida, Sarasota Film Festival. I don't know what to say about it myself. Where she's the <laughs> nominee by the United Nations, <laughs> like a woman of the year. 
Yeah, so that's going to be in April, and so that means I have to go back again in April. I've just been there. But again, it's really not about me or my tiredness, my moving up and down. I get, I get exhausted. And of course, there are a lot of things I also have to put and say, this is like taking something away from my life. But I also come back and think, this is again not about me. It is really about Northern Uganda as a whole. It's not even anymore about St. Monica only. And my whole focus is all about women and children. Many times people ask me, someone one time asked me, say, Sister Rosemary, are you gender sensitive? I say, very, very gender sensitive. Simply because I'm taking women with children, and the children are boys and girls. So that means I'm very gender sensitive. And so we try our best. Actually, where you are right now, this house, I had to make this house to be built to receive young women who are coming in from Republic of Tiris with their children. They would not know where to go, and people did not know how to take them. No school would take a mother and child. There was no facility for that. People were not prepared for that. And so I had to go to Italy to ask for money to put up this house. This is the first house I put to have women and children staying here in a boarding school. And at the same time, in the morning, the women would take their children to the daycare and they would be freed to go to study themselves. So we started addressing the need of education of mother and child. And also, it was the first place which was taking women with the children. And that continued, especially at the most difficult times when there were many young women returning from captivity after they were abducted <coughs> and lost their chances of education. We just decided that we would continue training these girls, giving them skills, different skills. And uh, for us, we never thought anyone would be considered a failure or anyone would be considered a person who has lost the chance. And that's why even the title of my book was Carefully Chosen, Sowing Hope. And if you see, we're using the analogy of a needle. You see, I don't have it. Oh, no, it is. We have a needle to sow. Sowing what? We are trying to put hope in people. We are trying to use their own hands to sow hope. And also to use their own hands, to use their energy, to use them as the resources to try to bring them back to people, to let people understand that these are people who are not wasted. They didn't lose any chance. They still have hope. And we say, the hope we are going to sow in you is that we know very well that the past is already gone and it looks like it was wasted, but we are going to start from where life seems to have been wasted or seems to have stopped. We're going to try to revalue their life again. We're going to try to make sure you saw all the pain you have away. And that's why for us, this school as a tailoring school, we teach dressmaking and cutting. We teach girls how to make different things like the purses you have seen. All is about restoring their dignity and also letting them know that it's not all about formal education, but it is about training and skills to restore your own dignity and also really to put their own destiny in their hands. This is why for a long time this school has remained for people who are in need. Either during the war or after the war or any time there, is, there will be a problem with women who cannot be accepted anywhere who will open the door for them. Children who are in difficulty will open the door for them. When you say that the prison is not strange to me, my office just as you walk by to come here, you see my office. One time I looked through the window and I thought, I said, we are doing a lot of things here to help disadvantaged <coughs> women, but we can go a step ahead. I looked at the prison right across this wall and I really knew that women are also detained in that prison with the kids. And I said, these are really the next advantage group of women who need to start helping. And so we decided to go right in prison. I asked them if they can let the children come out, to come to the daycare, have a moment with other children, 
play and also be fed and feel again like children. And the prison authority found it very difficult to give permission to me. They told me to write a letter to the commissioner in Kampala. I'm sure both both knows about that. And I told him, I said, it's not difficult. I can write a letter to say I need the children out. So I wrote a letter. And they answered, be nice, we say it's possible. You can get the children out. So every morning, the children walk. Their mothers accompany them. They bring them here. And the children remain with us the whole day from 8.30 to 5 p.m. Playing and being taken care of and receiving love here. And we do it all free of charge as part of our ministry. And they thought that was enough. It was not enough. It helped me to go in further. So we have started skills training in prison. We teach the inmates how to sew dresses, how to weave sweaters. Even we taught them how to make those buses. And just this last week I received a letter from an organization asking me if we can enter into partnership to teach more inmates. I thought that was great. I wanted someone to come in to make that request. Because we have been doing it on our own, but if someone else is coming to ask us to go into that partnership, I think it's something nice for you to do. So that will be our next commitment. And uh, we have a lot of things going on here, but the whole idea of running this place and other places, because we have a school in Atiyah, which is like one hour away from here, and also we intend to start one in South Sudan. And the reason for starting that is that we have our own sisters who work there. And also the rebels, the elderly committed a lot of atrocities also in South Sudan. So we really think we can also help the women there. And so the work for us is going to continue. And we hope we can get more people who can come in and partner with us. I know the Academy is already in partnership with us. And uh, I hope more volunteers like you people can come and join us to do more things. Mm. Thank you. I think that's very good. Do you have any questions for the sister? Uh, do the, uh, this time that the country transitioned out of, and that's a number of years now, yeah. But uh, what was that like living in Gulu, say, 10 years ago, when the insurgency was still occurring? Yeah, it was very difficult to live. Even walking from down there here would be very hard to walk because it was a place which was quite scary. You wouldn't know also with who you are sitting and what is going to happen next. And we used to have kids who are running away from their homes every day to take refuge here, hiding from the rebels who would have dug them at night, and every day we had like 500 kids sheltered here, every day. It was a very painful time. Today I was telling somebody how, yesterday I got one student of ours. I think she had deep trauma in her, and suddenly she was reacting in a very strange, really weird way. And he was saying that she has the devil, and so on, and everybody came around praying, and said, no, no, no. I have the medicine for those kind of devils. All of you go to sleep and leave this girl. So she remained there sitting, but afterwards she found she was all alone, she was alone, and she went back to sleep. And I was telling people, I said, that girl must be deeply traumatized. And we used to have kids here who are behaving the same way, going through a lot of hallucination. They would run from one place to another. So much so you would be scared. And one time I got really scared for that. But the whole thing was so painful for us to address, to be with kids without their parents, and yet you are scared at the same time somebody would come and maybe would have done them in your hands. But we found it was a great moment where we also bonded with these kids, and God definitely protected us. Nothing happened, but Gulu was a very difficult place to live in. From 2002 up to 2007, <coughs> up to eight. I think the rebels just stopped their abductions in 2006. And so people were still living in fear, but who couldn't hear more of abductions. And people still say, the war stopped. Now Northern Uganda is quiet. and. When I talk to people, I say, 
that statement is weak. We don't have to say that the works just stopped when we know that we are actually now dealing with the aftermath of war. If I see NGOs moving away from Gulu or from Northern Uganda, no, I always question, I said, this is the right time to come in and you're moving away. Because you really need to come to address the wounds in the hearts of people. People have the wounds right in their heart. And as we don't hear gunshots, but they are still hearing it. They are still dealing with it. And I think this is the time when we need all to join hands to come and address <coughs> the pain, accompany people and work with them. Did you have a soldier, an LRA soldier that ended up here? Yeah, I'm just trying to remember how the story went. He there came was, and yeah, he you, came. I was in the office and he just walked and got me right there. I didn't know that he was a, an LRA officer himself. And he asked me if I can give his wife. He said, I've come to collect my wife. And I told him, I said, do you have a wife here? I said, yes, I have my wife here. I asked him, did you marry her traditionally? He said, no, when we were in the bush, we were living together. I said, man, she was not your wife. That was the thing. You are a sex slave. You are not going to get any girl here who is your wife. <laughs> if you can be kind to me, I'll ask you to leave this place. And he walked and went. He said, okay, I'll go. But you see, that's where I say I have a lot of fear. I got so scared later on to imagine <laughs> if that girl walked in, as I was interacting with this boy, what would have happened? How would I have protected that girl? But the guy went out on the same. And later somebody told me, say, sister, that was one of the worst rebel commander. He would do anything on the way. I didn't know it, but he also listened to me and went out anyway. <laughs> Why do you think they left you alone? I don't know. I think God protected us. That's all. Really. There was no protection. Definitely. They, they were capable of doing anything. But again, I always make fun, but it was a reality. The NRA officers themselves knew we had young women who were also trained as officers, trained as killers. They were trained to hold guns. They were capable of fighting. So if they really wanted to come to attack them, they would confront themselves. I think they were very sure about that. So I say, my girls were well prepared anyway. And for me, I felt they were also a protection to us all. We were not scared to live with them. This girl, one time a man ran in, and I don't know if was a thief or an elderly or whatever. I saw girls running. They followed the guy and caught him like this. And thought, I was very happy. <laughs> yeah. And I handed him to the police. But the girls did it. So, you see, much as they thought they trained the girls as child soldiers or they were sex slaves, there was also the benefit that they had how to protect themselves. So I think in one way or another, they were also scared of coming here. But above all, it was really God's protection. That's just a joke. <laughs>